Just a few weeks ago, I was up in Greenland with the NASA team measuring the glaciers around Greenland's coastline from instruments that are mounted on an airplane, and it's kind of like a flying science laboratory. So it's my first day on this particular field campaign, and the flight engineer comes up to me and she gives me my flight suit. Now, I was expecting to get the flight suit, but it turns out that it's way, way cooler than I could have even imagined. It's the same kind of flight suit that an astronaut gets. Apparently, NASA just has this one kind of flight suit. The important part about the flight suit is it's made of Nomax, and that's a kind of fire-resistant material. It's the same kind of stuff worn by uh, race car drivers or stunt performers. But the really, really cool part of the flight suit is the design. It's got all these pockets and zippers and Velcro wrist te tighteners, and it's this fabulous blue color. So I take the flight suit and run back to my room to try it on for a mirror selfie, of course. It's this ridiculous looking mirror selfie. I'm waiting for the mirror selfie. Cue mirror selfie. Okay. So I run back to the room to get this crazy mirror selfie. And I'm putting the flight suit on, pulling it on, and I notice that there's the Amer American flag on my left shoulder. And there's the NASA logo that's sewn onto my right chest. And then there's the nickname that the pilots gave me, and it's over my left chest. And as I'm standing there in front of the mirror, this emotion just washes over me, and I pause. And I pause. <laughs> Come on, thing. There we go. And I wonder if I'm worthy of the suit. You see, I'm a science writer. No, not a science fiction writer, I'm a science writer. And what that means is I write science articles mostly about planet Earth. But I have doubts about whether my job is important enough. See, I understand that the pilots, they're necessary, and the instrument operators are necessary, and the mechanics are necessary, and the flight engineer is necessary, but what about me? Am I? I mean, I've never heard of a science writer getting her own flight suit before. And yeah, I've worked at NASA for about a decade. And yeah, I have photographic evidence that maybe I'll be able to show you, if we're lucky. I have photographic evidence, I do, there we go. I have photographic evidence of myself working in the field. But I also have evidence that maybe what I do isn't important enough. You see, I don't have a PhD. And sometimes people treat me as though what I do isn't as significant as somebody who does have a PhD that I'm not a real scientist. And yeah, I've worked at NASA for about a decade, and, but I'm not here representing NASA. I'm representing myself because I care. So I think about that riddle. You know the one about if a tree falls in a forest and nobody's around to hear it, does it still make a sound? And I wonder if science would become more relevant if more people heard about it because that's what I do. I make the sounds. I try to be loud enough so that more people can hear. But yet, the message is everywhere that only people with PhDs who do research are real scientists. I taught college for 13 years, oceanography. That's 26 semesters. And sometimes I taught multiple classes per semester. And every single class, without exception, on the very first day of class, the students would always ask me the same question. They'd ask, are your tests hard? And then they'd ask that very same question right before the first exam. Are your tests hard? And how I interpreted that question was they were telling me that they lacked confidence in their intellectual ability. They didn't trust their mental capacity. And so we learn to separate the world into science people and non-science people. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a scientist. How many times have you heard people say that? Have you ever said that? I'm not a scientist? And even at my work, I often hear coworkers using the term non-scientist to refer to themselves. And they work at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I mean, the term laboratory is right there in the name of their job title. And if somebody who works at a national science laboratory can't even own their position in the world of science, then what does that say about the rest of us? 
So yes, I tell my students, my tests are hard. Of course they're hard. Hell yes, they're hard. It's science. Science is hard, just like a lot of things in this world that are important are hard. I should know. I'm the one who dropped out of grad school. Yeah, and I take full responsibility for dropping out. It was my fault, my responsibility. I'm the one who gave up. I'm the one who walked away. No, I ran away. I did my very best to run as far as I possibly could from the world of science. But the further I ran, the more I realized that it was impossible to truly run away from science. And that's because science was inside of me. Science is part of the core of who I am as a being. And that's because all of us are natural born scientists, curious about the way the world works. Yes, you too. The human brain is wired to think critically, to objectively observe the world around us, and to seek the truth. And science is the only way we have of knowing the truth. It's the absolute best way we have of knowing the truth. Without science, we wouldn't know that the Earth was round. Without science, we wouldn't know that the Earth revolves on its axis. And sure, you already know that stuff. In fact, you take it for granted. But for Aristokis and Aristophanes, the two who did those calculations, those must have been difficult at the time. And it must have been difficult to convince society of those truths. And right now, climate scientists are busy calculating the amount of coal and oil and natural gas that people are burning. And climate scientists are also busy measuring the amount of carbon dioxide in Earth's atmosphere. And climate scientists are measuring the amount of temperature that has increased in Earth's atmosphere and Earth's oceans. And we're calculating the amount of glaciers that have melted, causing sea level rise. Now, I've been talking about Greenland a lot since I've gotten back. And sometimes it seems like people think it was some adventure vacation destination or something you're supposed to check off of your bucket list. But the truth is, just getting up to 80 degrees north latitude to meet the science team was a challenge and a struggle of epic proportions that took about 18 months, mountain upon mountain of paperwork and too many safety courses to even count. And then the nine days I spent up there, the average daytime temperature was negative 30 degrees. That's below zero. So despite, or perhaps because of those challenges, the experience was immeasurably invaluable, not just for me, but for science. So yeah, I fought my way back to science through determination and perseverance. And sometimes I leaned so far forward that I fell flat on my face. But you know what, that, what happened? I got back up again. Yeah, and then I face planted again and again, and sometimes again, yeah. Because when stuff's hard, we mess it up. But that's how we learn, and that's how we grow. Falling down and getting back up again is the same thing an athlete does. It's the same thing an artist does. And falling down and getting back up again is the same thing that a scientist does. And in the end, I'm the one standing there in that flight suit on that NASA plane. So now I'm going to offer you an assignment. You get to do your own version of what we were doing up in Greenland. Um, so it starts with collecting data. So remember, the science team measured almost every ocean terminating glacier around the entire coastline of Greenland. And then in order to calculate how much these glaciers are melting, the team has to go back repeatedly to measure the same glaciers in the same locations. And right now, it's halfway through the second year of a five-year mission. And then, in order to accurately predict how much sea level rise we're going to get from those melting glaciers, um, we have to analyze the data and then finally share the results. So I've just said three things, collecting data, analyzing data, share the results. And you get to decide your own entry point, whatever works for you, whatever you're interested in. You like collecting data? There's so many ways to do that. Start by taking a walk and thinking like a scientist. Remember to bring your journal so you can document things, count the trees. If you like trees, I like trees. If you want to become more involved, become a citizen scientist. And you might have noticed I keep using the word science team over and over again, and this is where I'm going to work in the wonderful gentleman who came up and tried to help me with this clicker. And that's because everything is done in teams now, especially today. Nobody does science on her own. In fact, nobody does anything on their own. We're all here together, even working a clicker. 
And right now, there are literally thousands upon thousands of citizen science opportunities where people from the general public can collaborate with professional scientists to study everything from aurora to bumblebees to zebrafish. And I'll just tell you about one thing. It's my personal favorite right at the moment. It involves taking photographs of snails and slugs and sending them, I know, I love snails and slugs. You guys, everybody who knows me in this audience knows I'm a total slug freak, right? So you take photos of snails and slugs and you send them to the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. And the purpose of this study is to um, catalog the diversity and also discover new species that have adapted to the urban environment. And what this shows you is that you can participate in science. You don't need to have fancy instruments and you don't need to travel really, really far away to discover something new about the world around you in your own backyard. Backyard. So I've talked about collecting your own data. As a citizen scientist, you can also help other people analyze data they've collected. But lastly, and perhaps most importantly, talk about science. Communicate science. Keep reading. Keep asking questions. Keep studying until you become a science literate citizen so that you can participate in the important scientific conversations that are happening around your own community. Because now is the time to get past, hey, look, it's Greenland. <laughs> now's the time, come on, now's the time. I said it and it started. Now's the time to get past this notion that there are science people and non-science people. Now's the time to belong. Now is the time to belong. So I encourage you to make science part of your everyday life. I encourage you to stay with science even if you feel like running or to come back to science if you've already turned away. So that regardless of your career, regardless of your resume, whether or not you have a PhD or a flight suit, go stand in front of that mirror and when you see yourself, you see yourself as a scientist. Thank you. <laughs>